inflation remains near a record high and it shows no signs of slowing. The consumer price You're index for September was up 8.2 percent compared to a year ago. Has made landfall as a category four winds of 155 miles per hour. Just between the West and Russia, Russian nuclear-capable warplanes were spotted in the Pacific. If you don't have your wallet, there's no problem. Just scan your palm to pay. Amazon One is a payment system that has been tested at several. Alright, so you're going to bookmark Matthew chapter 24. You're going to be coming back um, to Matthew chapter 24 um, at the beginning and the end of the sermon. So just keep your place there. So Matthew chapter 24 is kind of our basis, is kind of our timeline for um, this sermon series, looking at clues and milestones. Um, hopefully now, um, after this will be the third sermon in this series, um, we talked about um, globalism, the, the one world government, you know, where that, um, where that idea comes from. Um, we looked at um, the abomination of desolation, the Antichrist, the Antichrist. You know, there's been many Antichrists um, throughout history, but we looked at the Antichrist of the end times, or what we learned last week was Daniel's 70th week. So we're all experts on Daniel's 70th week, which is this, um, which is this seven-year period of the end times. And the question is, when will this be? When will this start? When is this seven years coming? So what we're looking at is what the Bible says, with the clues that, by, the, that Jesus gives us, the clues that the Bible gives us in in all different parts of the Bible and looking at what would be necessary for those things to come to pass. That's kind of the methodology of this sermon series. Um, tonight, look down at Matthew chapter 24 and look at verse number 33. Tonight we're going to look at some clues, which Jesus says um, in Matthew 24, 33, he says, So likewise ye, when ye see all these things, know that it is near, even at the door. So he's saying this kind of at the end of all the detail that he gives us, um, about, you know, basically leading up to the rapture when Jesus comes back and, and um, gets his saints out of the great tribulation. But he says, you know, at, at, in verse number 33, he says, I, I'm telling you all these things so you'll know when it's near, is what he's saying. He's like, so you'll have an idea. And then the, the last part of the chapter from verse 33 on is basically Jesus kind of exhorting us, saying, you all should not be like everybody else. He's saying... He's saying everybody else is going to be just, you know, going about their business, thinking that everything's fine, thinking that what they're doing is right, and then this is going to happen. And he even compares it to Noah and the flood. He says even, you know, when I flooded the whole world, he's like, everybody was just having a big party and just doing what they always did and being wicked and being violent, and all of a sudden, you know, it, the flood just came upon them. Is going to be exactly like that here. You'll notice um, in Matthew 24 when it talks about Jesus coming back, it says that the tribes of the earth, they mourned. They mourned. Why? Because they're eating and drinking and thinking nothing's going, to, going on. They got their own ideas about stuff. They're not paying attention to these clues, milestones that we're going to know about because we have the Word of God, we have the Bible, and they're going to see Jesus coming back. Everyone's going to see him. There's not going to be this like, uh, you know, all of a sudden there's a pile of clothes somewhere. Or, you know, you know, I saw a bumper sticker the other day that says driver may disappear at any moment or something like this, you know, from the left behind books. <laughs> but that's not how it's going to happen. Everybody's going to see Jesus and every tribe, meaning every nation on the earth, is going to, they're going to be like, why are they mourning? They're going to be like, uh, oops, the Christians were right. It's like the people knocking on my door were correct. So they're going to be um, afraid they're going to mourn. Okay, so look at verse number seven now. What are we talking about this evening? We're going to talk about um, a, some clues, some very specific clues tonight. Look at verse number seven of Matthew chapter 24. Um, the title of the sermon tonight is the clues. The title of the sermon is the signs in the earth. The signs in the earth. Look at verse seven. The Bible says, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes, in diverse places. Diverse meaning all over the place. They'll be in, you know, not just in one local place. Turn to Acts chapter 2 
and verse number 19. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 19. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 19. So we're looking at signs in the earth tonight. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 19, we see a prophetic verse here um, on the day of Pentecost, but it's also a, a prophecy of the end times, of the coming of Jesus. The Bible says in verse 19, it says, I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapors of smoke. Then shall the sun be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. You know, a reference again to the rapture, Jesus coming back, that day of the Lord. Okay, so the first thing I want to look at tonight, turn to Luke chapter 21. You're going to keep your place in Matthew chapter 24. We'll come back there. But let's just look at some more details. So Luke chapter 21 uh, is, a, is a parallel passage to Matthew chapter 24. One of the great things about the Gospels is you will find these parallel passages where you get a little bit more detail um, in one than you did in the other, or maybe a different perspective in one that you did in the other. There's no contradictions, but they just kind of give us a different angle on things, a little bit more detail on things. Look at Luke chapter 21 and look at verse number 11. There's something I want to point out here. We get a little bit more detail about a specific sign in the earth. Look at verse 11 of Luke chapter 21. The Bible says, and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places. So that matches Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 7, where we see these earthquakes happening in diverse places, but we get another detail on the earthquakes. So not only are these earthquakes going to be happening in diverse places, but they're also going to be great earthquakes. So we get two things, basically. We get magnitude of the earthquakes, and we get where they're going to be in Luke chapter 21 and Matthew chapter 24. Now here's the thing about earthquakes. So just talk about earthquakes in the Bible and how God uses earthquakes in the Bible. Turn to Matthew chapter 27. This fits because look, you have to, when you read the Bible, we want to understand, I mean, this is what God wants us to know about himself. The Bible is, there is much more to God, I am sure, than just the Bible. But the Bible is what God has given us to know about himself. And there's definite patterns that you can see on how God deals with us, how God shows us things, how God tells us things. Look at Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 50. Look, great earthquakes fits God's patterns of marking, you know, large events for us with these great earthquakes. Look at Matthew 27 and verse number 50. This is um, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. In verse number 50, the Bible says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple, in verse 51, was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Meaning, the earthquake to the point where rocks were torn apart. Rent means torn, you know, broken, right? When a garment is rent, it is, it is torn, all right? Look at verse uh, 2 of Matthew chapter 28, just one, um, just one page over probably in your Bible. And there's another earthquake that was used here. And it, look, it's not an it's not a insignificant earthquake is what I'm trying to get you to understand. Look at verse 2. At the resurrection of Christ, it is marked by not just any earthquake. Look at verse number 2. It says, And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. So look, here's the thing. The, the earthquake didn't roll the stone away. The earthquake was just there to mark some great event that happened. And it wasn't, I shouldn't say some great event, it was a great event, but a great earthquake was used to mark the resurrection of Jesus Christ himself. Look at Acts chapter 16, if you remember from Wednesday night. Acts chapter 16, you know, God used an earthquake to get the attention of, of this jailer. Look at verse number 26 of Acts chapter 16. And suddenly there was a what? There was a great earthquake again, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. So obviously the earthquake didn't undo everyone's handcuffs. The earthquake was there 
to get the attention of the people that, hey, this is a miraculous situation that is happening. All right? I mean, of course, this is where, you know, we get that great question in the Bible that is so valuable um, for doctrine in itself. It's just, you know, where the, that jailer at that point just says, what must I do to be saved? Just this simple question in the Bible, and then that gives Paul and Silas the opportunity to just say, hey, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You know, and thy house. They go preach the gospel to his family and his household, and it's just a great story in the Bible. But it's all marked by what? By a great earthquake. All right, so we get this magnitude in Matthew chapter 24 that there's going to be in Matthew chapter 20, or Luke chapter 21, talking about these earthquakes, these great earthquakes that will be in diverse places, all right, many different places. All right, so the, whole, the point I'm trying to make here at the beginning is that earthquakes in general, these great earthquakes, are used by God throughout the Bible to mark big events, okay, to mark big things. Turn back to Luke chapter 21. So that's earthquakes. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, if God was going to mark, you know, the beginning of Daniel's 70th week or the coming of Daniel's 70th week, um, you know, entering into Daniel's 70th week, if he was going to mark that with a great earthquake, kind of fits, kind of fits his, you know, modus operandi that he's been using in the past. You know, he marks things with earthquakes. He's done that in the past. Look at verse 25 of Luke chapter 21. Now there's something else, more signs in the earth here. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. And upon the earth, distress of nations, we'll get to that um, in, in, towards the end of the sermon, with perplexity. And then look at this, the sea and the waves roaring. Now let me ask you this question. What could possibly, so we see another, um, we see another sign in the earth here, of the sea and the waves roaring. So what makes the sea and the waves roar. I mean, we're talking about large storms here, is what the Bible is literally calling out. It, we're talking about hurricanes. We're talking about typhoons. We're talking about things that just kick up the seas and just make these large waves. So look, this is what Jesus is saying is there are going to be signs in the earth. We're, we're looking at tonight, we're looking at earthquakes and we're going to look at storms and, you know, signs in the world. I mean, there's other two, you know, other two things that are called out, like famines, um, famines and, and drought, really. Um, you know, famines and pestilences. We're not going to look at pestilences tonight. But we're not going to look too deep into famines because we already kind of looked at what causes famines in the first sermon. You know, one of the main things, there's really two things that cause famines. And one is drought which that's a sign in the earth, and that's a sign that God also uses, that he's not happy with things that are going on usually when God sends a drought or stops the rain. You know, we talked about that a couple weeks ago as well. But you know, another thing that causes famine, and one of the reasons we're not going to get into the detail of it because I've already talked about it in the very first sermon, one of the main things in the world that causes famine is war. So if there's a massive war, and, and I've talked about the estimates you know, that if there was another World War III, if that was caused, they've done estimates that billions of people would die. And guess what? The billions of people that died, it would not be from the blasts of bombs. It would be the vast majority of people would die from famine. So God is calling that out as well. But I want to look at this idea of these clues mainly tonight of earthquakes and storms that Jesus is specifically calling out in Luke chapter 21 and Matthew chapter um, 24. So you say, there's earthquakes all the time. How in the world could we possibly, you know, are you going to try to like, you know, tell us that the end times is going to be tomorrow because there's earthquakes? There's earthquakes all the time. I mean, I, I, I finally experienced my first California earthquake, you know, like last year. I mean, I was in a building and literally the the wall, I could see the ceiling shaking. It was, and, I'm, and it was like two seconds long, and I was like, that's it? It was kind of disappointing, to be honest. I mean, I've been raised my whole life to believe, like, California is going to fall in the ocean, and Nevada is going to have beachside property. That, that state's going to fall right in the ocean. That's what people, you know, where I'm from would talk about California. And then I was finally in this earthquake, and it was like, you could barely see things moving, and I, I called my wife, I'm like, 
were we just in an earthquake? And sure enough, it came over the radio. And I was like, hey, I was in, I'm like, I'll take that over winter any day. You know, no problem. I can do that, right? But here's the thing. So here's the thing. And here's the reason that I pointed out the words that Jesus used when he said great earthquakes. All right, because here's the, let me just give you some trends here. Let me give you some trends on earthquakes. All right, there's a little thing called the Richter scale. Who's heard of the Richter scale? I'm sure everybody in California knows exactly what the Richter scale is. But it's basically, it's a, it's a way for the USGS or everybody around the world to measure the magnitude of earthquakes. And there's something super interesting that I found here. But let me just give you some trends and some ideas on how many actual earthquakes there are from year to year, okay? Now, the Richter scale goes from what I could see on the Richter scale. It's basically, it goes from one all the way to nine and greater, all right? But I'll tell you why nine and greater doesn't really matter all that much. But if you look at, um, they're, they're categorized by number, and then each range has an actual name that the Richter scale assigns to them. Let me give you some examples. Uh, an earthquake from 1 to 1.9 on the Richter scale is called, is categorized as a micro quake on the Richter scale. Okay? There are, how many uh, per year are there in the world? There are several million per year in the world of these types of earthquakes. All right? And we keep going down the scale, or up the scale, I guess you could call it, um, from 2.0 to about 3.9, they're, they're categorized as minor. So we go from micro to minor. And those numbers go, they range between 1 million earthquakes of that magnitude per year to about 100,000 if you go all the way up to 3.9. Okay, so look, that's a lot of earthquakes. You know, and if you look at, you know, the earthquakes that we experience, like the one, the one that we experienced in Fresno, I think or the one I experienced in Fresno, maybe there's more that have happened, but it was, I don't know, it was 200 miles away, the epicenter, and it was, I think it was a three point something. So I felt one of these million, these million what they call minor, I mean this is, this is the Richter scales wording, micro, minor, okay? Now, if we get up to some bigger numbers, let's go to four, let's go to four and all the way to 5.9, okay? Uh, 5.9, um, if we look at a 5.9, what, what are we categorizing? It can, can, the, the actual wording is called moderate, okay? It goes um, 4.0 is light, and then 5.0 to 5.9 would be moderate. And just to give you a description of what that type, it would be ca can cause damage of varying severity to poorly constructed buildings, zero to slight damage to other buildings felt by everyone. So, Everyone should feel this in the area, but it probably won't damage too many things. How many of these types of earthquakes are there per year in the world? About 1,500 of the 5 to 5.9. So those are light and moderate. And then it gets up to 6 to 6.9 is, is considered strong. Like I said, the Richter scale's wording, not mine. 7 to 7.9 is considered major. Okay, this is considered a major earthquake. Now, if we look at a 7 to 7.9. Just to give you a, uh, some context here, the 1989 San Francisco earthquake, and I remember seeing this on the news, I, you know, I, many of you lived here, I'm sure, um, but that earthquake was a 6.9. So that was, a, I mean, that was what people would consider, a, I mean, it's categorized as strong. That's the Richter scale um, category. It's a strong earthquake. There's 100 to 150 per year in the world of that size. Okay, but that one happened to hit a highly densely populated area, and I, I believe 60-some people were killed, billions of dollars in damage, you know. So, look, that's not something that we would consider insignificant as people on planet Earth, right? So, if we go above that, 7.0 to 7.9, that is categorized as major. That's the Richter scale word, all right? There's 10 to 20 of those per year. I hope you see where I'm going with this because as we can look at this minor earthquakes and we can say there's millions of minor earthquakes every single year, that's not what the Bible is pointing us at here. The Bible is pointing us at what the Bible calls great earthquakes. The King James Bible is another great reason that we, you should be King James, but the King James Bible calls them great. That's the word it uses again and again and again. Revelation chapter 11, when it talks about you know, the wrath of God, towards the end of the wrath of God, it'll be marked 
by a great earthquake. The same event in Revelation chapter 16. Um, it's the, the sixth vial being opened by the sixth angel. It's a great earthquake that marks that event. Great, great earthquake, all right? Now, on the Richter scale, 8 to 8.9 and 9.0 and greater are in this category. And guess what word is used to mark that category? Great. I mean, that's an interesting coincidence. I don't know if the person that, you know, invented the Richter scale in 1930 or whenever that was, you know, was a King James Bible reader or whatever it was. But the point is, is that guess how many of those per year there are in the world? Over 8.0. One on average. So I think if I read the Bible and I see that the Bible is saying, look, God marks things by great earthquakes. And God is saying that when Daniel's 70th week is approaching and when we're in Daniel's 70th week, it's like there's going to be great earthquakes, meaning they're not. And then I can go and I can look at the events in the Bible where these earthquakes are tearing rocks, meaning they're tearing mountains, they're tearing things, they're causing major damage, they're breaking foundations of prisons, all these things. And I can say, look, you know, I mean, I think if it goes from one per year to 10 per year, for a few years, maybe we should pay attention to that. That's all I'm trying to say. It's a clue. It's a clue. We don't want to have an earthquake over 8.5 and be like, the end times is near. But the point is, is that we should pay attention to what the Bible is saying. This is a great clue for us. There's not millions of great earthquakes every year in the world. There's on average one in the whole world. All right. So look, um, that's an interesting correlation right there. So that is something we can definitely watch for, all right? This is why it's a clue, not a milestone, all right? We don't see a, an 8.5 earthquake and say the Antichrist is on the earth right now. Where is he at? But we notice these things and we watch these things. That's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 33, and through the rest of the chapter, he's like, hey, you all are going to understand what's happening. You all should know what's going on because I'm telling you these details, all right? So look, earthquakes, to me, maybe to the untrained eye when I was like, oh, there's millions of earthquakes. I feel an earthquake every six months or whatever. Look, to the, to the trained eye, a great earthquake is not that common, and I think it's something that, I think it's a great clue. I think it's a great clue of the end times and what the Bible calls in Daniel chapter, Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 8, the beginning of sorrows. Something that we should definitely pay attention to. How about this one? Storms. Drought. What about this? What about this? Now, I, I did go and I tried to find some... I couldn't find a consensus on whether or not earthquakes are increasing or not. There's a lot of noise in that conversation out there. I'll tell you why there's noise in that conversation towards the end of the sermon. But um, there's a lot of scientific data out there, and I'm not saying I believe the scientific data, but I'm paying attention to it, that storms and drought are increasing. And you will find, and you're all understanding where this is probably going already, but there's a lot of people out there right now in the scientific community saying storms are getting stronger, you know, droughts are getting worse, and all these different types of things. Now, I don't know if I completely um, believe that, but it's definitely something that I'm paying attention to. Let me just give you a couple quotes um, from NASA, which don't get me started on NASA. It's like, how inefficient can we be? <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right. That's, a, that's just a personal opinion of mine. Anyway, NASA says this. We do see more and more hurricanes in the Atlantic every season getting to Category 3, Category 4, or Category 5 compared to seasons 40 years ago. So NASA is saying that According to the last four decades, they do see an increase. Um, it's really hard to get good data on this, by the way, because we're talking about thousands of years of history, and, and we've really just started being able to track these things in like the last 50 years. So it's not that great of, of a data set, but NASA says we're seeing more that are severe. All right? Time says this. One PNAS study from 2020 found that as as of 2017, about 38% of the planet's tropical cyclone activity reached major intensity. That is a category three, four, or five, very similar to what NASA said. For North Atlantic hurricanes specifically, the rate was similar at 42%. But those rates have been ticking up over time, particularly 
in the North Atlantic. As, the, as it's 24%, they kind of boil it down to this, it's 24% more probable today that a cyclone on planet Earth will be at a major intensity compared with four decades ago. It sounds, you know, like they're maybe pulling from the same data set and kind of the same narrative. Um, but in the North Atlantic, and in the North Atlantic, it's 260% more probable. probable. Th what they're saying is that same amount of storms, but they're getting more magnitude. They're getting to category three, category four, category five um, more easily. All right? So you're, you're thinking, you're thinking people will definitely notice this, right? People will definitely notice that, I mean, this is how I used to think when I would study the Bible and I would start reading the Bible. And I was really, I used to be into like, um, you know, a lot of Bible archaeology and all these things like, oh, if we could find Noah's Ark or if we could find the Ark of the Covenant, then everyone will believe that the Bible's true. Wrong. Why? Because like this is actually, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt and say that NASA is right, time is right, all these studies are right. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt and say they're correct. And these storms are getting more powerful and are getting more severe over time. But how will people not notice what the Bible says? Number one, because nobody knows what the Bible says. <laughs> I mean, how many times have I said over the last year, there's never been a time in the United States, it's probably worse in the world, where people know less about the Bible. People have no idea. I mean, look, the stuff we're studying tonight, this is not Christianity 101 stuff. You know, this is, this is some complicated prophecy, some complicated things, these timelines and what Jesus is saying here. So you say, how will people not notice? But look, just like with the Antichrist that I brought up last week, just like how will people not notice that there's this guy that sets himself up in the temple of God and says that he is God, makes some, side, some sort of image that he sets up, some sort of idol that he forces people to worship. How will people not throw a red flag on that? Because at that point, we're going to be into this, I mean, every religion, every major religion is going to think he's their Messiah. There's going to be this attitude of, you know, all this divisive doctrine needs to stop. We all need to be, it's all, we all worship the same God. I mean, this is the type of stuff that is going to lead to that being accepted. And just as that, we can see how that's going to play out. Today, this religion of man-made climate change is going to explain away all of this for people. We can already see it happening. We can already see it happening. They are already claiming this clue. They are already claiming this clue. There isn't a hurricane that happens when you don't see, you know, people standing up and we're ruining the earth and we did this to ourselves and we have to stop um, doing all these things. But look, let me tell you something, folks. It is fascinating to watch this play out. It really is. I mean, it's unfolding before our very eyes. I mean, I don't know how far we're into it or how far, how long it's going to take, but we can already start to see things that we wouldn't have seen 20 years ago. We wouldn't have seen 20 years ago how people were going to you know, be able to explain away some of these clues that we're seeing today. But here's what's even more interesting. Here's what's even more interesting. It's all tied together with the previous two sermons that I preached because this clue, this clue, it builds on those first two sermons. It builds on globalism. And it builds on the idea of the Antichrist or this one world leader that's going to come and bring this global, you know, government and global system together. Because look, these clues, these clues, the storms and the drought and the, the they'll be politicized. They will be politicized to bring in globalism because they're going to be politicized as global issues. It, this is a world problem. This is a world problem, folks. We need to take this seriously. It'll be used to destroy nationalism. Think about the countries. Just think about in your mind. I won't even mention them. I'm going to use one as an example. But just think about the countries right now that everybody vilifies. Why? I mean, yeah, they, maybe they do bad things and all this. But look, there's a reason that this happens because nationalism must go away to fix this problem of, you know, these clues, these signs 
in the earth that we're talking about tonight. Let me give you one example. Let me give you one, just one simple example of how this religion, it, first of all, how this religion is false, this religion of man-made climate change, how, how false it really is, and how it will be used to destroy nationalism. All right, let me just give you one example. I'm going to use the example of China. All right, and look, I'm not for or against China. I'm sure they're, 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 I'm kind of against them. They're bad, right? They do a lot of bad things. But look at this. China, I mean, talking about just man-made climate change, that's what everybody's worried about in the United States and all over the world and Europe and everywhere. Just we're putting too much carbon dioxide into the world and creating, making these storms worse and making the, the earth worse. But look at this. China, these are actual facts right here, okay? China burns more coal than the rest of the world combined and has accelerated mining and construction of coal-fired power plants, driving up the country's emissions of energy-related greenhouse gases the, in the fastest pace in a decade. So what are they doing? They're ramping up how much coal they burn in China. Okay? You say, you say what? Wait, there's more. It's way worse than this. Okay? <laughs> I mean, this is just fact. China is also the dominant manufacturer of wind turbines and solar panels that they sell to us. You say, do we sell anything to China? Yeah, we do. We do sell something to China, and I'll get to that in a second. But they sell this stuff to us, but they provide cheap energy to their people through burning coal. There are literally 33 gigawatts of coal fire generation that have started construction just last year in China. 33 gigawatts. Just think about that as, as, as 33 of the largest plants that we have in the United States. Each one of those plants burns about 1,000 tons of coal every hour. 1,000 tons every hour. That's 66 million pounds in one hour. That's what they just started building last year. How much is under construction now? How much is going to go under construction this year? Who knows? China is currently building over half of the world's new coal-based power plants. 33 gigawatts started last year. That is the most new coal-fired power capacity China has undertaken since 2016, which means they are ramping up the way they are, you know, three times more than, get this, the rest of the world combined. Meantime, in the meantime, China still consumes nearly five times as much coal as India, nearly six times as much coal as the United States, and is building a huge number of new plants. According to 2021 yearbook, uh, anyway, let me just read the last article or the last paragraph of this. China is hardly alone in turning to coal to meet growing energy needs. India gets roughly 70% of its electricity from coal. Just China and India have half the world's population, just so you know. We've got about seven point some billion people on the planet. About three billion of those people live in China or India. You know, I think we forget that sometimes as Americans. There's 330 million people here. There's, you know, there's three billion people in those two countries. India gets 70% of its electricity from coal. The Modi government recently ordered the reopening of more than 100 closed mines to meet rapidly growing demand and even um, greater by the country's crushing heat wave. So India and China, 3 billion people, nearly half the world, and they're just ramping up how much energy they generate from coal and how much, and here's the thing, here's the thing. They send all these solar panels and all these wind turbines to us and we buy all these things, but we sell uh, China something, you know what we sell them? We sell them our coal. You're like, what? That's true. China doesn't have that much coal. They get their coal from, I think, most of it's from Indonesia, the next is Russia, and the next, us. We've been selling them, we've been shutting our plants down on the East Coast and selling all that coal to China for years. So, for the people that are in the religion of man-made climate change, we could stop burning everything in the United States tomorrow and it would make zero difference. Zero. That's not an opinion, that's just what's happening. So if you believe that false religion, just start digging that bunker, is all I can say. Because, but here's the thing, go back to Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 7. You say, why do you bring this up? Here's why I bring it up. Go back to Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 7. Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 7. This is why, say, look, say what you want about China, but they are acting in their own interests as a nation. 
And that is why at some point that has to go. Oh, like, that's not my opinion. That the Bible is telling us that this is what's going to happen. The Bible is telling us that, you know, this, this world leader is going to come in. He's going to make this covenant with many in Daniel chapter 9. Remember the path here. He's going to make this covenant with many in Daniel chapter 9. And through the process of Revelation chapter 6, that war where billions of people die, he's going to turn that covenant of many into a global alliance. And people like, you know, countries that are acting in their own self-interest are the ones that will have to get with the program from Daniel chapter 9 to Revelation chapter 13, where you end up with that global alliance. All right, now go back to Matthew chapter 24 and look again at verse number 7. Now, I hope this makes more sense for you. It says, now let me read the last part of the verse for you. It says, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. But what does it say has to happen in the first part of the verse? Nation must rise against nation. You see that? All this nation stuff needs to go. And all of the signs in the earth are going to be one of the things that is used to get rid of the national self-interest. You can, you can see it happening. You can see it happening if you're just reading the Bible and watching what's going on. So look, and look, the, the people taking these clues and saying, you know, using them as, as this religion of climate change, they're just, they're what, what Lenin would have called the useful idiots. You see, the people, the, the wickedness in high places, the principalities and the powers at the Antichrist level, they're going to use those people to just gain control. You can see that happening too. What is, this, what is this religion being used to? It's being used to just, it's being used to gain control of people. No, you can no longer do this. You can no longer buy that. You know, you can no longer buy a car in 2030 or whatever it is. You can no longer buy a lawnmower. It's just, it's used. I mean, these are small examples of the same methodology. But these wicked principalities and powers that are going to be at the level of trying to create this global alliance are going to use these false religions. And I'm not saying that, that this global warming thing is the only one that's going to be used. It's going to use people like that as the useful idiots to put in place the control structure that they need to have the, their arms around this whole thing. That's how this is going to go. I don't know when it's going to go. I don't know, you know the timeline as far as when this is, but we can see the mechanics of it. That's the, that's the beauty of this. We can now see the mechanics of it where I could say that 20 years ago, I couldn't see the mechanics of this the same as I can see them today just because of the things that we're watching happening. So the signs of the earth, and look, earthquakes is one thing. You know, they're going to claim earthquakes too. They'll, claim, they'll blame earthquakes. They're already doing this. They'll blame earthquakes. These great earthquakes will start happening, and they'll blame it on somebody drilling for something. They'll blame it on somebody fracking a well. They'll blame it on somebody pumping water out of the ground too fast. And they will use it for what? Control. Control of resources, control of assets, ultimately control of the people in the world, which is what, you know, if you want to have a global alliance with everybody on board, you know what you need? You need control. You need control. So look, all this will be blamed on human activity of some kind, and, and it'll be used to, you know, push for global control, the control needed by the Antichrist when we see him come on the scene, all right? So look, there's a lot of things that still need to happen. There's a lot of things that still need to happen. We looked at last week. There's no temple. There's no daily sacrifice. You know, there's, there's none of these things that have happened. But it's just fascinating how we can see all of these words that were spoken by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago kind of coming into, coming into play, kind of fitting together. We can see, at least we can see how this puzzle, how these puzzle pieces are going to fit together to a degree, right? Which we couldn't say that that would happen you know, we couldn't see that, you know, even just a couple decades ago. So look, what do we know so far? Daniel's 70th week. We need, a, we need a world leader. We need a world leader to pop up. We need him to be this guy that's trying to bring this peace accord. In Daniel chapter 9, we need him to do this. We need that covenant with many. We need that to be transferred into Revelation chapter 13 through war and all these other methods of control to that global alliance of Revelation 13. 
then we're going to see the, you know, then we need a temple, then we need that daily sacrifice, then we're going to see that abomination of desolation. But these signs in the earth, we can see, hopefully you see now how they fit together and why nation against nation is in that same verse as we see in Matthew chapter 24, talking about these signs in the earth. So look, it's kind of cool to, to see these things, and it's, it's kind of neat, you know, that, that Jesus said, you know, be ready and, and be, you know, watching. I don't think it's 10 years from now. I don't think it's 20 years from now. I don't know when it is, but if we can see it coming now, I am sure we'll be able to see it even better in 10 years. This is a, a glass darkly that we look through, and it just, as time goes on, it just gets clearer and clearer and clearer. So it just, we just need to use this to motivate us to, you know, study the Bible, tell people about the Bible, um, and just, you know, I pray all the time that God, you know, gives us, um, you know, I don't pray that God doesn't come tomorrow, because I know Jesus isn't coming tomorrow, but I do pray that God gives this country more time, that God, you know, is more patient. I don't know how he could possibly be more patient than he is already, but, you know, we, I just want more time to get the gospel to more people, and that should be our motivation on this earth. But these are some great clues, these signs in the earth. And I do believe that they're very valuable clues and we will notice them happening as we already see this going on now. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.